ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first session of the new term at Edgeway United Synagogue. We're fortunate tonight to have the distinguished translator Robert Chandler to discuss Vasily Grossman and his novel Stalingrad that he and his wife Elizabeth translated into English earlier this year. The novel is the prequel to Life and Fate, for which he wrote a revised translation in 2006, and it is said that this was the tipping point for the book's reputation in the UK. His translation of Stalingrad was described by The Guardian as undoubtedly an amazing achievement of translation and scholarship. It is lucid and re readable, with moments of wonderfully evocative prose. The New Statesman wrote that Stalingrad has been beautifully translated by the Chandlers and lovingly pieced together with the sense of passages restored. And only this week, and you probably don't know this, the American magazine Counterpunch, in its review of Stalingrad, wrote... It's a small miracle that we have an English translation of Ashley Grossman's novel, Stalingrad, given the huge amount of restorative work that the Chancellor has had to undertake to piece the novel together. They have constructed something that comes darn close to being a masterpiece and went on to say that it's time to praise translators just as much as writers. If you read Stalingrad, you understand what I mean. Robert Chandler's translations from Russian include many works by Alexander Pushkin, Vasily Grossman and Andrei Platonov. He has also compiled three anthologies for, for Penguin Classics of Russian short, short stories, of Russian magic tales and with, uh, and with Boris Thralyuk and Irina Mashinsky, The Penguin Book of Russian Poetry. He is a co-translator of three volumes of memoirs and stories by Teffy and has published a short biography of Pushkin. Teaching is increasingly important to him and he runs a monthly translation workshop at Pushkin House, Bloomsbury. I have great pleasure in calling on Robert Chandler to discuss Vasily Grossman and his magnum opus Stalingrad. Thank you very much. Um, can I just ask how many people here have read anything by Grossman. Thank you, if you're right. Um, okay, we, um, our knowledge of Soviet literature in the West is, um, it's, it tends to be rather random, um, and it largely seems to depend on sort of international political scandals. So, um, Pasternak and Dr. Zhivago are well known um, the Soviet authorities inadvertently did an extraordinary effective job in calling attention to it by um, coercing Pasternak into refusing the Nobel Prize, and um, this made it into a bestseller in the West. Um, Joseph Brodsky became famous. Joseph Brodsky became known in the West thanks to being exiled to the north of European Russia, and Solzhenitsyn's deportation obviously drew enormous attention to him in the early 1970s. Um, Grossman was, he was born in 1905. Um, he was publishing throughout the 1930s. Um, he was translated a bit during the war years and immediately after the war when, um, you know, our being allies with the Soviet Union um, resulted in more work being translated from Russian. Um, but then he was rather ignored. Um, we tended Cold War thinking led Western Slavists to kind of really believe that nothing of any interest could actually be published in the Soviet Union. And we were only interested in you know, the writers that were smuggled abroad or whatever. And um, so Grossman's two great, he wrote two long novels, um, what, Stalingrad being the first half and Life and Fate being the second half. You can look at it as a diligy or two halves of one novel. Um, the first half was published in the early 1950s in the Soviet Union um, with great difficulty. He battled with his editors for three years and the book went through, you know, he changed the endless, endless versions of it. 
um, as he was trying to meet the demands of his editors. Um, the second half was utterly unpublishable. Um, he draws an absolutely explicit and overt equation between Nazism and Stalinism. He sees the two regimes as being mirror images of each other. And you know, that was as heretical as you could possibly get in the Soviet Union. Um, the Soviet authorities had learnt something from their experience with Pasternak and um, they realised it was best to be a bit subtler in their dealings with awkward writers. So, um, with um, Life and Fate in 1961, they confiscated the manuscript. They left Grossman himself in peace. Um, they continued allowing him to publish and republish other work of his, um, a mixture of carrot and stick. Um, and, you know, people just forgot about the novel. And then um, in the early 80s, a copy of the manuscript was smuggled out, a microfilm of a copy of the manuscript. And um, a Russian language edition was published in Switzerland in 1980. And this was quite quickly translated into a number of languages. And because of this dramatic story of the novel's arrest, as they used to say, um, it got a, quite a lot of attention. It actually got more attention in France and Germany to begin with. Um, it was a bit slower in the English-speaking world. Um, it's largely thanks to historians like Anthony Beaver that it um, really became well known in the sort of early 2000s. Um, but because of this slightly odd history, um, there are a lot of people who think of Life and Fate as being a complete novel on its own, and they don't actually realize that it's the second half of a much, much longer novel. And there was this lazy assumption that because the first half had been published in the Soviet Union, that it couldn't really be very interesting. And I read this, I read this view so many times from kind of literary historians, I, respect that uh, I believed it and um, was quite slow to um, get round to reading Stalingrad. Um, when I did read Stalingrad, um, thanks to persuasive, another very persuasive historian, um, I was immediately very moved by it. Um, I then became quite fascinated as I began to notice the differences between the the f there were actually three editions in the 1950s. So the 1952 one was the most heavily censored while Stalin was still alive. 1954, after his death, less censored. And 1956, still you know, quite a lot freer. And I became really fascinated by these differences, um, which weren't entirely what I expected. Um, to some degree, it was a matter of content. Um, you know, the, Soviet Union, the Soviet authorities didn't want too much being said about military defeats or people being dissatisfied with collective farms. Um, but often it was more a matter of tone. Um, Soviet literature on a grand theme like Stalingrad, and this, this is the battle that both at the time and now, is generally seen as the turning point of the Second World War. Um, it was the first decisive defeat of a German army. A large German army was entirely surrounded and um, either killed or taken prisoner. Um, so, uh, a novel on such a grand theme, and this really became, you know, it was the sort of legitimizing 
act for the, well, it's a sort of foundation act for the Stalinist regime that, you know, proved that all the kind of suffering, all the terrible things that had happened didn't really matter because, you know, we've defeated the Germans. Um, so this was of immense importance and everything about it had to be written with the utmost grandiosity and seriousness. You couldn't have um, you know, Red Army officers being frivolous, selfish, silly. You couldn't have anything petty in the novel. So, you know, most of the insects got edited out. Most of the mentions of fleas and lice, of which there are obviously you know, quite a lot, um, they got edited out. Um, just anything silly, anything unexpected, anything ironic, you know, just everything um, in the 1952 edition had to be sort of stonily serious. Um, so I became very interested in, in this, and I began by making notes, little footnotes for myself. And um, then sort of late in the day, it um, dawned on me, well, I got some helpful um, Stiers from a, a colleague, a young colleague in Moscow. And um, I had thought that the, you know, it was just, it would be complete. I'd read that there were 10 different manuscript versions of the novel in, um, in Moscow archives. And, you know, I just didn't really see the possibility to spend the rest of my life sort of trying to piece, piece these different versions together. Um, so I had thought I would just stick with the published versions. Um, but um, a young colleague sort of gave me some helpful guidance about these different versions. And the last six were really just, um, they were more like sort of proofs of different sections of the novel. Um, so there weren't quite as many complete versions as I thought. And um, it did actually end up appearing quite simple. That there, there was a first version, which was an um, almost unreadable manuscript with huge numbers of crossings out. The second version seemed to have got lost. And the third version was a readable typescript with some handwritten corrections. And this was much, much more bold and striking than any of the published editions. Um, not quite a complete novel, you know, there were some plot inconsistencies in it, um, a draft, but very, very bold, very, very interesting indeed. And then the fourth, fifth and sixth versions were um, ever greater degrees of compromise with the demands made by Grossman's editors. So um, and eventually I, I realised that I could and that there were quite a lot of passages from this third version that I could incorporate into the published, along with the published text. So that's what we did. I made notes, obviously, as to all the bits that um, we did introduce from these earlier versions. Um, so my, you know, the few rules I followed were um, Obviously, not to introduce any passages from the typescript that would cause plot conflicts, and only to include passages where I could fairly clearly see why Grossman's editors might have objected to them and why Grossman himself would have considered them important enough that he'd be glad to see them in print. So, um, the two novels, Stalingrad and Life and Fate, um, are they one novel or are they two novels? Are they basically the you know, two halves of one novel or not? Um, in terms of plot, they are absolutely two halves of one novel. The second novel starts the kind of the day that the first novel ends. Um, the characters are the same, you know, apart from the ones who've died in the first novel. Um, there are a very, very small number of new characters in the second novel, but only a, a very few. So in terms of plot and characters, it's one novel. Um, the second novel, um, obviously written at a greater distance from the war, um, 
It's uh, written by a writer who has you know, been through even more disillusions. Um, he'd learned more about the the gulag in the 1950s, in the mid-1950s, uh, there were lots of people returning from the camps, so it was possible to learn a, a great deal more. Um, so the second novel is a more considered moral and political statement. It's a political statement about Nazism and Stalinism. It's a moral statement insofar as Grossman is repeatedly asking a question about how is it possible to behave in a moral and decent way in a dictatorial regime. Um, he's asking that question with regard to people actually in camps. Um, so you get one character called Ikonikov, who is a sort of holy fool type. Um, he eventually signs his own death warrant. He's in a German camp. Um, he signs his own death warrant by having realized that what they're building is the foundations of a gas chamber. He refuses to carry on working, so he makes his choice. Um, so you get choices in very extreme situations like that. Or you get people in positions of privilege, like the hero Victor Strum, who is um, He's in a position of privilege when um, he's a nuclear physicist and when it dawns on Stalin during the course of the war that nuclear physics matters if the Soviet Union is to remain an important military power, um, Victor Strum is showered with privileges and um, it actually turns out to be much harder for him to behave in a decent and moral way when he's in a position of privilege than when he was a persecuted outsider. So you get these moral questions being asked again and again in different ways and different situations in the second novel. Um, the first novel, um, Grossman's task was very different. Um, he was absolutely explicit. Um, he wrote Within six, in an article he published six weeks after the end of the war, um, he was talking about our task as writers being to remember that we, we have to enter into battle against the forces of forgetfulness. And um, Stalingrad is about remembering. And um, Grossman is often quite encyclopedic. He likes lists, he likes to be complete. So we get remembering from every possible perspective, um, real and even imaginary. So, um, you know, one of the more ironic passages is um, you get the, a group of German officers, they, they've sailed into Stalingrad, um, they've captured practically the whole city um, in less than a day. They think that they're just, you know, a few little tiny pockets of Red Army soldiers to you know, clear up during the next day or two. And they're, they're celebrating and they're going around clicking their cameras and collecting souvenirs of this great day to, you know, to pass on to their grandchildren. Um, so you get remembering like that. Um, you get hypothetical sort of remembering um, on the Russian side, Commissar Kremov at the end of the novel as he's about to cross the Volga into the besieged city. He's wondering how the novel, how, sorry, how Stalingrad, how the battle will be remembered in sort of 500 years time. Um, you get remembering that is perfectly straightforward and orthodox and in line with Soviet thinking. Um, and you get remembering that is um, so controversial that it's deeply, deeply encoded. Um, so there was a very important, um, a very important Soviet scientist called Vavilov, 
on Nikolai Vavilov. He was a plant breeder, geneticist, biologist. His ambition was to end world hunger. He traveled a great deal. Um, he was a scientist who listened to people. Um, he would talk to peasants in different remote parts of the world, and um, both in the Soviet Union and elsewhere, um, learning about you know, different strains of wheat that you know, might have particular properties, resistance to drought or whatever. Um, he was very, you know, he was a bright, open-minded, internationally minded, a man with lots of contact, contacts among foreign scientists. Um, this made him suspect. He was arrested in the late 1930s and um, he died in, of starvation in prison in, the, in, I think, 1941 or 42. Um, Grossman was himself always passionately interested in science and um, he, he wants to remember Vavilov in his novel. Um, and he does that um, in code. He has a peasant soldier who bears the same surname. It's a common enough name, Vavilov. Um, this is just a very ordinary peasant. Um, so, you know, it's possible for the authorities not to realize that this has anything to do with the scientist of the same name. But um, this peasant is also a very inquisitive and open-minded man. And um, even though he's pretty much uneducated and um, you know, he's probably never le left his collective farm before being called up into the Red Army. But he's always eager. He's always um, wanting, you know, with every new person he meets, he's discussing you know, what, what kind of millet do, you, do they grow in your area? Do potatoes grow well in your area, he's asking exactly the same questions that the scientist Vavilov would have asked. And um, there are actually several, um, there are several other coded references to Vavilov in this novel. He's not, he's much better known in a lot of Western countries than he is in Russia. He's not widely read in Russia today. Um, is um, the Russian nationalists hate him. Um, at part of this is a matter of anti-Semitism. This Grossman was entirely Jewish. Um, and both his mother and father were Jewish. Um, he probably didn't, you know, probably only knew a very few words of Yiddish himself. Um, so he was kind of Soviet Jew rather than a um, traditional um, believing a Jew, um, but in any case, you know, just the fact of him being Jewish is enough to make him suspect in the eyes of Russian nationalists. And um, on top of that, um, there are some very anguished pages that Grossman wrote about Russian history in his short novel, Everything Flows, and they contain some passages which you know, they are actually written out of pain and love. Um, but, you know, Grossman uses the phrase, the slavish Russian soul, and um, Russian nationalists haven't forgiven him that. So Grossman is not widely read in Russia. He's not widely studied, and um, his archives haven't been, you know, there's still a huge amount of material that hasn't been looked at in his archives. And there are important discoveries that we're still making about Grossman. So um, only um, a year and a half ago, I suppose, um, I received a letter from a, um, a young Jewish woman from Odessa originally, now living in Cologne, called Tatiana Detmer. She has a German husband. And um, she brought my attention to something entirely new, which was that the um, hero of the two novels, the most important figure of all, 
a nuclear physicist called Victor Strum, who at one level is very clearly a self-portrait of Grossman. He shares a great deal of Grossman's biography. But he's also quite clearly modelled on a real Ukrainian Jewish nuclear physicist called Lev Strum. Um, Lev Strum was an important nuclear physicist. He you know, was one of the founders of Ukrainian nuclear physics, which was very big in the 1920s. Um, Alef Strum was um, executed, well, he was arrested and executed in 1936. Um, he was very effectively edited out of um, scientific history. Um, his books, papers were all confiscated. And nobody realized until Tatiana Detmer came along that um, Grossman's hero was modeled on this real figure. There's absolutely no doubt about it at all. Um, Grossman was himself passionately interested in nuclear physics. That was his ambition as a teenager. He was going to be a physicist. Um, he lived in Kiev. And um, we know where Lev Strum was a popular and lively lecturer. And, um, you know, we have got um, documentary evidence. There is a letter where um, Grossman writes to his father and mentions having, um, in the mid-1920s, having visited Lev Strum and borrowed some money from him. Um, <clears throat> And this, you know, this was not known. Um, Tatiana Detmer learned this because she was working at a centre in Cologne um, to help, to provide help to um, people who have suffered, to Jews who have suffered because of the Shoah. And um, there she met an elderly woman called Yelena Lvovna Strum. Lvovna is the patronymic from Lev. She is the daughter of Lev Strum, um, a very lively, intelligent woman in her 90s. Um, I went pretty quickly to Cologne to meet her. Um, a very, very intelligent woman with um, an excellent memory, could speak very interestingly about almost every, everything in her life. But, um, unfortunately, I mean, I was very glad, you know, I'm glad to have made the trip, glad to have met her, but um, she was obviously so traumatized as a 13-year-old girl by her father's arrest and immediate execution that she had just blotted out all memory of him, really. It wasn't just that she didn't want to talk to me. She was really quite close to Tatiana and she was, you know, just couldn't really think of anything to say. Um, so, um, Grossman, in his um, usual slightly oblique way, um, He found ways to memorialize his inspiring teacher in this book. Um, so this is Victor Strum. Um, remembering the first lecture that he went to by his teacher. He never forgot this first lecture. Chapersian had not sounded like a professor of physics. His deep, slightly hoarse way of speaking, at times slow and patient, but more often quick and impassioned, it seemed more like that of a political agitator. Similarly, the formulae he wrote on the blackboard 
were far from being cold, dry expressions of the new mechanics of an invisible world of extraordinary energies and velocities. They sounded more like political appeals or slogans. The chalk squeaked and crumbled. Japersian's hand was as accustomed to axes and spades as to a pen or to delicate instruments made from quartz or platinum. Sometimes when he nailed in a full stop or sketched the graceful swan's neck of an integral, it was as if he were firing a series of shots. These formulae seemed full of human content. They could have been passionate declarations of faith, doubt or love. Japersian reinforced this impression by scattering question marks, ellipses and triumphant exclamation marks over the board. It was painful when the lecture was over to watch the attendant rub out all these radicals, integrals, differentials and trigonometric signs. All these alphas, deltas, epsilons and thetas that human will and intelligence had shaped into a single united regiment. Like a valuable manuscript, this blackboard should surely have been preserved for posterity. Well, that of course is exactly what Grossman has done. So, um, that's one figure, or two figures, Vavilov and Strum, whom Grossman has gone out of his way to memorialize. Um, more important still is his own mother. Um, his own mother, um, Grossman was born in Berdichev. Berdichev was really the sort of Jewish capital in the Russian Empire. Um, Grossman reproached it, felt racked with guilt to the end of his life for not having been um, quicker and more determined to get his mother out of Berdichev as the Germans invaded the Soviet Union. So she was one of the 30,000 Jews who were executed um, in a mass execution outside Berdichev. Um, so Grossman's mother is an absolutely central figure in both novels. So in Life and Fate, um, it's probably the single chapter of Life and Fate that has attracted most attention. Um, it's been made into a one-woman play. Um, in the Radio 4 dramatization, Janet Suzman read this chapter superbly. Um, she, um, realizing when she's um, when the Jews have already been put in a ghetto in Berdichev, have been herded into a ghetto, she understands what's going to happen, and she writes a last letter to her son, um, which gets smuggled out of the out of the ghetto. Um, it's a very moving letter. It's a kind of lament for the for the whole of East European Jewry, and. Um, perhaps the single best-known chapter of Grossman. Um, astonishingly, this letter manages to be equally important in the first novel, but in the first novel it's important through its absence. So we hear about this letter again and again. Um, we get told, we learn at different points in the novel, we learn about different moments in the letter's journey. Um, we learn how someone carries it across the, the front line. Um, we learn how it gets delivered to the apartment in Stalingrad where they expect Victor Strum to be living. 
um, the, a, there's a great deal of irony around this letter's journey. So um, when it gets, um, when someone takes it to this apartment in Stalingrad, um, a young friend of the family, a young woman, um, opens the door and she's sort of appalled at being given this kind of filthy package. And um, she says, you know, her immediate reaction is, you know, this looks as though it's been lying in a cellar for the last two years. And she wraps it up in the kind of pink, pink wrapping paper that is, you know, that people make Christmas tree decorations out of. Um, she then passes the letter on to Colonel Novikov, who is about to fly to Moscow, and who can deliver it to Viktor Strum, who is at that moment in Moscow. Colonel Novikov arrives at Viktor Strum's apartment when Viktor is having a romantic tete-a-tete -tete with a pretty young neighbour. He's irritated. Viktor Strum is irritated at being interrupted. Um, he drops the package into his briefcase and forgets about it. Um, forgets about it for 24 hours. Um, when he eventually notices it, he at first mistakes it for a bar of chocolate that he'd bought for his pretty young neighbour. Um, eventually, he reads the letter, he realises, you know, he opens the package, realises what this is, reads it late at night. Um, we don't get a word of the actual letter. Um, the next thing we know is um, Victor Strum, the following morning, looking at himself in the mirror, astonished that he doesn't look sort of 40 years older. He expects his hair to have turned white overnight. Now, um, what you need to know to understand why Grossman did things in this way is that um, while there was a, a brief period during the war years when um, it was possible to write about the Shoah to some degree at least, um, Grossman did in 1944 publish one of the first accounts one of the first published, you know, fairly complete, accurate and largely accurate and detailed accounts of the function of Treblinka. Um, once the war was over and there was no need to try and enlist, start when Stalin no longer had any need to try to enlist American support, um, it became increasingly impossible to write about the Shoah in the Soviet Union. So um, Grossman knew very well that for a variety of reasons it was impossible for him to include the actual text of this letter in his first novel, um, apart from the general ban on discussion of the Shoah and the Soviet Union was becoming increasingly officially anti-Semitic in the late 40s and early 50s. Um, apart from that, um, Grossman was also infringing um, a still greater taboo by um, writing, you know, the mother in her letter writes about the, um, the extent to which quite a lot of the local population um, were collaborating with the Nazis. You know, that was absolutely taboo in the Soviet Union. Um, so it was impossible for all these reasons to write straightforwardly and truthfully. Um, but also at a deeper level, um, at a more personal level, um, it was, you know, what had happened was um, beyond people's ability to take it in. So, um, Victor Strum, 
So I shall read about a page now from consecutively. Since his return to Kazan, Victor's anguish had only deepened. No matter what he was thinking or doing, his thoughts constantly, relentlessly, returned to his mother. Getting on the plane for Chelyabinsk, he had thought, she's gone. And now I'm flying east. I'll be further away from where she lies. And during the flight back, as they approached Kazan, he thought, and she'll never know that we're here in Kazan. In the midst of his joy and excitement at seeing Ludmilla again, he said to himself, when I last spoke to Luda, I was thinking I'd see Mama again once the war was over. The thought of his mother, like a strong taproot, entered into every aspect of his life, big or small. Probably it always had done. But this root that had nourished his soul since childhood had previously been elastic, yielding and transparent, and he had not noticed it. Whereas now he saw it and felt it constantly, day and night. Now that he was no longer drinking what he had been given by his mother's love, but giving everything back in confusion and longing, now that his soul was no longer absorbing the salt and moisture of life, but giving it back in the form of tears, Victor felt a constant, incessant pain. When he reread his mother's last letter, when he divined between its calm, restrained lines the terror of the helpless, doomed people herded behind the barbed wire, when his imagination filled in the picture of the last minutes of his mother's life, when he thought about the mass execution she had known was imminent, that she had guessed about from stories told by a few people who had miraculously escaped from other shtetls, when he forced himself with merciless obstinacy to imagine his mother's feelings as she stood in front of an SS machine gun by the edge of a pit amid a crowd of women and children, what he felt then was overwhelming. But it was impossible to change what had happened, what had been fixed forever by death. He did not want to show this letter to anyone. He did not want to speak about it even to his wife, his daughter or his closest friends. Several times a day, Victor passed his hand over his chest, over the jacket pocket where he kept the letter. Once, when the pain seemed unbearable, he thought, if I hide it away somewhere, I might slowly start to calm down. As things are, this letter's like an open grave. But he knew that he would sooner destroy himself than part with this letter that had, by some miracle, managed to find its way to him. Victor reread the letter again and again. Each time he felt the same shock as at the Dacha, as if he were reading it for the first time. Perhaps his memory was instinctively resisting, unwilling and unable, fully to take in something whose constant presence would make life unbearable. Everything around him seemed the same as before, yet there was nothing that had not changed. Victor was like someone seriously ill trying to carry on as usual. The sick man still works, talks, eats and drinks, 
even laughs and makes jokes. But everything around him has become different. Work, people's faces, the taste of bread, the smell of tobacco, even the heat of the sun. And everyone around him also senses that something has changed, that there is something different about the way this man works, talks, argues, laughs and smokes, as if some thin, cold mist now separates him from them. Once Lyudmila asked Victor, What are you thinking about when you talk to me? What do you mean? I think about whatever we're talking about. So, um, Grossman was unable to, he realised, he obviously understood right from the beginning that there was no question of actually including the text of the letter in this novel that he was trying to publish in 1952. Um, so rather than toning it down, rather than, say, omitting mention of Ukrainian collaborators and you know, which might have made it publishable. Rather than doing that, he um, he did the opposite. He he um, really drew attention to its absence. You know, the letter is like a kind of black hole in in Stalingrad. Um, Grossman can't write about it. Victor Strum can't talk about it. He can't even really talk about it to himself. You know, Grossman very very has a very fine psychological understanding of um, you know, Victor Strum's memory instinctively resisting um, that it's as if he's constantly reading the letter for the first time. Um, so um, it's an extraordinarily effective, I mean Grossman does this a number of times in bigger and smaller ways um, of you know, turning some difficulty, some difficulty with ed his editors to his own advantage. Um, you know, Gorston was constantly having to um, make compromises with his editors, and yet he you know, always managed to find some way of actually, you know, using that compromise in some different way to what his editors had intended of using it to his own advantage. So um, I think that, um, you know, that is one of the kind of binding, perhaps the deepest binding thread between the two novels. Um, I think that's probably where we should, um, I should leave Stalingrad for tonight. Um, the um, remaining few practical things I'd like to say is that, um, I mean, people do nearly always um, say that they find these long novels um, surprisingly easy to read. Um, that they are page turners. Um, nevertheless, if you're someone who um, finds the idea of a long novel intimidating, um, he, the short stories that he wrote at the end of his life are absolute masterpieces. So um, if you prefer to start reading Grossman or something shorter, then um, there's a collection that we've published called The Road, which is, um, I mean, The Road is the title of one of his last short stories, but we were also using The Road um, to indicate that it's the kind of road of Grossman's life. Um, so there's stories and articles from the whole of his life, but um, the short stories he wrote in his last few years um, are absolute masterpieces. They're probably, you know, the very finest of his writing, the most perfect of his writing. Um, so, but I mean, they're never going to be as well known as these two long novels. That's why I'm particularly wanting to call attention to them. Um, and also, um, we don't yet have exact dates, but um, 
sometime in um, late November, early December, there will be a four-hour radio, BBC Radio for dramatization of Stalingrad. Um, and around the same time, um, the eight-hour dramatization of Life and Faith that was done several years ago, and that will be repeated on Radio 4 Extra. Um, so, um, thank you very much, um, Nathan, for inviting me to speak. And um, please feel free to ask any questions about this novel, um, about Grossman in general, um, or even about Soviet literature in general. Thank you. I'd like to ask you about the craft of translation, not just the content of uh, Grossman. I mean, how do you manage to make a book that's written in Russian sound like it's the natural mother tongue of it should have been English because it's it flows so smoothly and it sounds so natural in English. I, I'm, I'm wondering how compatible. It's not a one-to-one -one translation. It's actually. Do do. You, I'm not sure I'm being very clear. Yeah, you're being absolutely clear. Um, there are very few writers that really turn out to be easy to translate. Almost every writer is difficult in some particular way. Um, really, it's just revising and revising and um, working a lot of the time orally. Um, so I, I do work. This is something that um, people often find a little hard to understand. Um, I work closely with my wife who um, does not know Russian, and at this point people, you know, if it's just in conversation, people often say, oh, so she's, she's an editor, is she? And I say no, um, that we do work closely together at quite an early stage. So I'll be reading sentence by sentence um, a draft to her. Sometimes it'll be a, you know, that I have already got it, a draft of some kind, um, completely typed out um, with some very difficult writers. I may just be doing it off the page in Russian. But anyway, we'll be going through it sentence by sentence. Um, she is just listening. She has an ability which I don't have myself to kind of hold a sentence in her head or you know, a paragraph in her head more or less. Um, without needing to be able to see it. I need to be able to see it and hear it myself. Um, but anyway, we kind of bat it backwards and forwards until, you know, either until we're both happy with it or until we realise that, you know, this is defeating us today. We better leave it till tomorrow. Um, and she also has a, an excellent visual imagination, so she'll sort of notice if there's been some inconsistency of, you know, characters in the wrong place or something. Um, it is absolutely crucial, this oral dimension. I mean, it's the most basic advice that I always give to other translators. And I'm surprised sometimes um, how sort of grateful people <laughs> seem for what seems to be something quite basic and elementary. Um, with Grossman in particular, one, one difficulty, um, I mean, it's not, he's not, um, for the main part, he's a writer who is content to use ordinary, fairly plain language. He uses extraordinary language occasionally when it's the only way to do something but he doesn't go out of his way to write in a kind of modernist, expressive, unusual style. Um, but what is difficult is that he um, is an extre extremely observant writer 
with a quite incredible memory. There's a lot of information packed into his sentences. So especially the kind of beginnings of chapters will often be the sort of recently having been promoted, you know, translating ultra-literally, and the recently having been promoted colonel with, you know, two faded shoulder tabs and one new shoulder tab on his, you know, on his shoulder, um, walked into the room and approached the sitting in the armchair, red-headed so-and-so. And you've got all this information, all these embedded participial clauses um, packed into one long sentence. Russian can handle these long sentences much more easily than English. So, of course, you have to break the sentence up into separate sentences, but um, most of the time. Um, but then you find that you've kind of, the way you've done it, you've put the, all the emphasis onto the least important bit of a sentence. So then you have to redo it again and again. So it's that kind of patient, plodding work um, took up quite a lot of the, the time um, just to get it, you know, just to get it clear. Um, I hope that answers the question. You said he had quite a lot of arguments with his editors and the publishers and so on, and lots of bits were moved around, taken out. Did he keep the bits that weren't allowed to go in? Did anybody ever find... Um, a box somewhere hidden under the bed with all these scraps of paper that couldn't go into the book? Um, well, the Soviet authorities have always, they do have a kind of reverence for literature. They always have done. So, um, you know, they have always been um, very conscientious about looking after archives. So what I referred to is the third version of the novel, which is a, you know, it's a complete thousand-page Typescript um, that you know is preserved in a Moscow archive. Um, an Italian scholar sent me a complete scan of it many years ago, and um, so yes, you know we that's the typescript that we you know it, bits of it we inserted into this published text. So this. What I've been reading from is a more com a more complete version of the novel than has ever before been published. It's more complete than the Russian version. Um, there are some passages um, that um, were obviously important enough to Grossman that he thought, okay, well, you know, I'll include them in Life and Fate. So. Um, in Stalingrad, um, there's this German governess called Jenny Genrichovna. Um, she's an ethnic German. I imagine she's from a family of Volga Germans, so you know, huge numbers of hundreds of thousands of Volga Germans at one time in the Soviet Union. So um, Jenny Genrichovna, in um, this first, in this early typescript of Stalingrad, she is living with Victor Strum's family, with the Shaposhnikov family in Stalingrad. Um, well, Grossman obviously at a fairly early stage realized that you know, having a German living with his, his main family was a complete no-no, that you know, that was not going to get through his editors. Um, so um, there are some lovely pages about her, some very, very funny Charming, of course, an absolute is funniest and charming. Um, some of those pages um, he incorporated in Life and Fate, you know, many years later. Um, other pages um, I've translated and um, not yet published. You know, I will publish them one day. Um, so, yes, you know, as far as I know, everything has been preserved. Um, I hope that one day. I mean, just as early, complete early versions of War and Peace um, are now available both in Russian and English. Um, I hope that you know, this early typescript does deserve to be published in full. But um, as I said earlier, it is a, 
It is a draft. It's not a complete finished novel in itself. And for instance, there is one character. There is an officer, um, which in this early typescript, um, Grossman hasn't quite made up his mind what to do with him. So um, in some chapters, he's called Novikov. In some chapters, he's called Darinsky. And um, but is in, in this typescript, he is, it is just one figure. And then um, at a later stage, Grossman split this figure into two. And you know, there are two officers in the published versions, you know, one called Novikov and another called Darinsky. Um, so yes, you know, most things have been preserved, but there haven't, you know, there aren't enough scholars working on Grossman um, working in archives is, you know, it's, it's a, lab a laborious business, and you know, I, I wish there were more people um, going through his archive. Uh, to enable you to do what you do and write, do you have a? Did you have a? historical background, literature background, or a linguistic background, or a combination of everything? Um, I mean, nowadays, there's a kind of proliferation of um, MAs in translation studies and so on. Um, they didn't exist when um, I was first, you know, translating. Um, no, I just have a degree in Russian and English. Um, I lived in the Soviet Union for a year in the 1970s. Um, I don't have any particular a background as a historian um, it was really just thanks to a um, an older friend of mine, um, a Soviet Jewish emigre art historian called Igor Golomstok, um, who emigrated in the early 70s. Um, we became quite good friends. And um, he was working for the BBC Russian service in um, the late 70s, early 80s. And um, he persuaded me to take an interest in life and fate. I mean, initially I just laughed him off because I didn't, um, you know, he pushed this great novel at me and said I should translate it. And um, I said, Igor, I don't read books that long in Russian, let alone translate them. But um, Igor, Igor was an obstinate man. And, um, he sent me, um, a few week, a month or so after that, he sent me um, transcripts of his four half-hour programs that he'd done for the BBC Russian service, and yeah, this was a bit more manageable for me than reading the whole novel. And um, even though at that time I was you know, quite young, um, at that time I I didn't really think I was interested in this kind of you know what seemed at at that date to seem rather seem rather old fashioned kind of writing. I was more interested in poetry or more sort of modernist writers. Um, nevertheless I, I did thank God have the the sense to realise that this was something remarkable and um, so I did eventually act on Igor's suggestion. I, I can ask the last question. Um, was Grossman working in an environment with other writers or, or on his own? I ask that because in America, in the Stalinist, in the McCarthy area, um, like-minded writers were gathering together and often putting on their own productions in spite of the state. Now, I realize it would be more difficult in the Soviet Union, but did he have a sort of camaraderie with other writers? Um. I think probably that sort of varied at different times in his life. Um, 
So there were some writers who did um, take Grossman under, you know, give him some help in the 1930s, and um, including Maxime Gorky at the very beginning. Um, during the war years, um, this was really the time of sort of Grossman's greatest public success. I mean, he was a very, very popular and acclaimed war correspondent. So um, he would certainly have, you know, seen a lot of the other war correspondents like um, Simonov and um, Ehrenburg. Um, he was working with Ehrenburg and um, many other writers on compiling something of huge importance, which I haven't mentioned at all, um, the so-called Black Book, Churna Kniga. Um, so this was a compilation. Ehrenburg was originally the chief editor, but um, Grossman took over as chief editor. It was a compilation of documents um, mostly eyewitness documents to do with the Shoah on Soviet and Polish soil. So this was a huge project. Um, and it, you know, initially it was, you know, Stalin supported it because it was international. Um, it was under the auspices of the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee. And um, it was a way of you know, getting American Jews to um, pressurize their government into you know, joining the war and um, supporting the Soviet war effort. But um, after the war, um, it was decided not to publish this book. So it was actually set in print, but you know, it was in type, but never published. So, you know, it was having a lot of... Um, dealings with other writers because he was doing, you know, he was editing that. Um, he was close friends with this very, very different writer, Andrei Platonov, um, who is at least, you know, Platonov, well, for me, Platonov and Grossman are the two great Soviet writers, very, very different kinds of writers, and um, Platonov writes in a much more extraordinary way than Grossman. Um, but you know, they each valued the other's gift. Um, so that was the one writer who was really close to Grossman during his last years. And I think during the 1950s, um, I mean, he would have, the Soviet authorities, um, I mean, they had this sort of network of um, houses of creativity, so-called, um, sort of holiday, you know, it's like closed hotels, really, for writers. So in, you know, different, on the Black Sea coast, on the Baltic coast, and so on. I mean, it was a regular thing that, you know, members of the Writers' Union would go there for their holidays. They were, you know, it was a great privilege. So, um, you know, all these writers would have had some connection with one another through, through these places. But um, I don't think there were other writers after Platonov's death. I think Grossman became um, somewhat isolated during his last years. The one other friend um, deserves mention, that's Simeon Liepkin. Um, who wrote a memoir about Grossman. Um, he survived Grossman, so he was probably the one writer who um, remained close to Grossman to the end of his life. I'd like to thank you for giving us an insight into an area very few of us know about, and I think it gives us an incentive to read both the huge novels. Um, I think until now, most of us thought of 
the Soviet literature and drama as Chekhov, and you know, could we go and see another uh, an, 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 another Three Sisters in the theatre? So uh, that, Chekhov was Grossman's uh, favourite writer. <laughs> by the way, I would say that. So I think you've widened our horizons. I look forward to listening to the four hours on radio uh, on radio on Stalingrad, and indeed, I've never heard the eight hours of Janet Sussman uh, on the earlier. Um, uh, um, life and death. Um, life and fate. Uh, sorry. Life and fate. Life and fate. Sorry. Uh, yes, I'm. Uh, I'm thinking of an American. <laughs> um, um, j- just a, a final thought that um, he was writing in the era before computers, and had he been writing now, I don't think we'd have had all these drafts to look at, and, and we would only have a final version, and we wouldn't know what he really thought. So, thank you very much for the insight you've given us into his great tomes, um, and we look forward to reading the books. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.